Um, hello, um, uh, welcome to the second day of our workshop, Facing the Great Derangement. Um, we had a very stimulating day yesterday with, uh, where we listened to our first keynote speaker, Gisela Jefes, and we had very wonderful uh, presentations with a lot of interesting and important discussions. So I'm really thankful for uh, your participation and, and me and as well as Ken and John Franco that have organized this, com this workshop. And we will begin this day and I have the uh, enormous pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker, uh, Victoria Saramago, uh, who is an assistant professor of Hispanic and also Brazilian studies at the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures at the University of Chicago. Uh, she has a PhD degree from Stanford University, as well as MA and BA degrees from the State University of Rio de Janeiro. Her work uh, covers 20th and 21st century Latin American literatures with a focus on environmental studies. Her very recently uh, published book, Fictional Environments, My Missis, Deforestation and Development in Latin America, uh, demonstrate it's, it was been published by Northwestern University Press. And in this book, uh, Victoria demonstrates that literature can help us make sense of environmental change by showing how novels have inspired conservationist initiatives and offered counterpoints to developmentalist policies. And also how environmental concerns have informed novelist agendas in their work as essayists, politicians, and public intellectuals. Uh, she's also the author of Oduplo du Pai, Ophelio Ethniso, the G. Cristoval Tessa, uh, which investigates the autofictional writings of contemporary Brazilian author Cristoval Tessa. And she has plenty of other publications uh, within the field. Um, and uh, Victoria's uh, presentation uh, uh, has the title of Fiction uh, Writing and Environmental Conservation in Latin America. But before giving Victoria uh, the word, uh, I would like to make some, uh, some comments about the dynamics of this uh, seminar. We will listen to, to Victoria's presentation like that lasts for about 45 minutes. And then you will have the opportunity to make questions and, and make comments using the chat function or the Q&A function. Both uh, are fine and we will read the, the questions um, for, for Victoria. And um, an another announcement is that the, uh, it, this is regarding the parallel sessions. Um, we have uh, in the afternoon, parallel session five and six. Um, parallel session uh, five will begin at 14.45. Uh, that is 15 minutes later than planned in the, in the program. Uh, whereas uh, session five will begin at the, at the plan time at 14.30. Uh, um, so welcome, Victoria, and um, good morning for you at 6 a.m., more or less, in Chicago. And we're really happy that you can be with us for this keynote uh, session. Thank you so much, Susana. Yeah, it's 6 a.m. here, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> and um, thank you very much to Susana, to Ken, to Franco, David for the invitation and for all your help uh, in organizing uh, this. I am so, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I wish I could be in Stockholm with you all, uh, but uh, well, I am happy to be able to, to bring a bit of my thoughts on fiction writing and conservation uh, today. Let me share my screen. And thank you all for being here. I don't know if it's as early for you all as it is here. Uh, but I know that we have been um, dealing with many different time zones in those pandemic times. So thank you for whichever adaptations you had to, to make to be here. Okay, so here's the cover page of my presentation. And I am going uh, to talk today a bit about portions of my book uh, that Asusena already talked about, fictional environments. My Mises is Deforestation and Development in Latin America, which came out last November. And in a few words, fictional environment investigates how novels have become sites for the production of knowledge about imaginations of and interventions in Latin American environments. 
and I focus on a period of accelerated urbanization and deforestation from the 1940s to the 1960s. So in this book, I explore the role of fiction in developing environmental imaginaries, but also in establishing environmental policies or in helping the establishment of environmental policies uh, through readings by Alejo Carpentier on the Venezuelan Grand Sabana, João Guimarães Rosa on the Brazilian backlands, the Sertão, Clarice de Spector on the urbanizing suburbs of Brazil, uh, Juan Rulfo on the Mexican countryside, and Mario Vargas Llosa on the Peruvian Amazon. Today, more specifically, I'm going to talk about the first part of my book, uh, which is named Conservation. Uh, and in this part, I focus on the relationship between fiction writing, while well, in conservationist policies uh, in the region, through the works of Guimarães Rosa and Carpentier. And these are the two authors on whom I'm going to focus my presentation today. And I make the point in this, uh, in this portion of my book uh, that together with films, photographic and journalistic materials, TV shows and other cultural objects, novels have played a role in shaping views of the area that in spite of their remoteness with respect to their um, most of their reading audience have come to play, have a symbolic importance and have helped inspire conservationist initiatives. So I'm going to begin with a few considerations on the nature and definition of national parks, which will be the basic conservation unit discussed in this presentation. Then I'm going to talk about each author and then we'll have time for like a longer considerations about what this conservationist narratives and this uh, relationship between fiction writing and conservation uh, could be in this context. So national parks were created to preserve certain environments, right? That's, uh, that's obvious. Due to, their, due to their beauty or the need to address the degradation of vulnerable areas. They are par excellence spaces without human inhabitants. Since the world's first national park, Yellowstone, was created in 1872 in the United States, there has been a constant tension between parks as wilderness areas to be kept free of human presence and as institutions that serve the nation through science and tourism. The absence of human inhabitants has been at the root of some contradictions noted in classic scholarship on national parks. We can think, for example, of Roderick Nash's classic essay, The American Invention of National Parks, uh, in which he says that the United States democracy is named as a um, crucial impetus for the creation of national parks in that current form. But this democracy seems to include only middle-class uh, tourists who visit the parks while excluding local, often Native American populations who are expelled from their area. Such displacements, not always conduced in a fair or smooth fashion, have had a deep effect on this group's lives. In spite of the environmental impact of tourism, after all, national parks usually imply a concept of nature as a pure romantic wilderness that is out there untamed by human hands, which does not fit well with the reality of people living and working in these spaces. Thus, national parks are meant to preserve or recreate a nature untouched by humans, at the same time as they are used for the enjoyment of humans, especially white humans. As Alison Barley shows, this paradox is clear, since the areas that receive visitors will necessarily be no longer devoid of humans. A wilderness such as Yellowstone National Park, and I quote her, designates an area that appears to be affected primarily by nature, one in which men's imprint is present but substantially unnoticeable. It describes an image, not a reality. End of quote. So uh, before continuing on my considerations about national parks, uh, let's take a look at the two authors and about, well, the national parks uh, with it, their works dialogue so as to give some more uh, concrete materials to work on, to work with. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about this novel by Brazilian author uh, João Guimarães Rosa. Grande Sertão Vereda was first published in 1956 and, and it, was, it is his uh, only novel and it is one of the main classics of Brazilian literature. It is a novel that talks about the Sertão, the backlands, uh, not of the northeast of Brazil, where it's usually where the term Sertão is usually um, employed today, but rather the Sertão of Minas Gerais, so more in the southeast 
of Brazil and close to the central plateau where the, the current uh, Brazilian capital, Brasilia, now is. Uh, so what I want to propose about this novel is that it has operating as an environmental agent in the region of Minas Gerais, in the northwest of Minas Gerais, um, over the past few decades. As such, this work constitutes a paradigmatic example of how fiction can set standards for a reality that is perceived as lost in an area of accelerated environmental changes, this one. The novel's agency, however, is not separable from the prestige that Guimarães Rosa work has had in Brazil and abroad. And nor can it be understood without attention to the author's intervention in the complex and multifaceted meaning of the term uh, sertão and the way it has acquired, the, the meanings it has acquired in Brazil. Yesterday we had a beautiful presentation uh, by Steffi Burnout on, on, this, on this term. So while many critics consider the universality of Guimarães Rosa's fiction, and this was something that really came up in the early criticism of Guimarães Rosa's work from the 1950s, but until the 1980s and to a certain extent to today, that his fiction would talk about the region, but it would be universal, talk about like universal topics that most often are um, uh, identified with topics of European literature. In other words, this work would be universal by adopting some kind of a um, uh, local way of um, uh, bringing some like a modernist, uh, European high modernist component to the work. Of course, it's much more complex than that, but just to give us a, a general initial sense, we could uh, phrase it in this way. Uh, so what many critics consider the universality of his fiction, I argue, has played a real role in the conviction that the real area of Northwestern Minas Gerais should be preserved. These efforts to keep Guimarães Rosa Sertões alive have led, I argue, to a reversed form of manises in which particular interventions in current realities aim to imitate fictional works. To talk about the Sertão of Minas Gerais as a fictional environment in this case means to consider the expectations about the Sertão based on its representation on Guimarães, in Guimarães Rosa's works as well the role of a, of a whole repertoire of cultural products on the many sertões. So I propose that these implications of the term sertão and how important it has been in Brazilian literature and culture, uh, mostly in the first half of the 20th century, they dovetail with sustainability environmental management projects uh, that use the works of Guimarães Rosa as a symbolic justification for addressing the effects of deforestation and urbanization. So in the first chapter of my book, I discuss three initiatives. Uh, the first one is the Guimarães Rosa Touristic Circuit. You can see the map here. Um, the second one is the Projeto Manuel Zão. Uh, this is their logo. Um, and, but today I'm going to focus on the third initiative that I discuss, which is the Grande Sertão Veredas National Park. Um, so this park, and I have here an image of the park. This is a, a vereda, which is like this little lake or swampy area, uh, usually with the buritis, which are these palm trees, you know, uh, that are very typical of this, of this, uh, of the, the, the surroundings of the veredas. And there are many other plants and birds uh, that are like endemic to, to, the, to this area and more specifically that can be found around the Veredas. Uh, so the Grande Sertão Veredas National Park was created in 1989 and it had a unique mission of emulating um, a, the landscape of a fictional narrative, Grande Sertão Veredas, an objective that is expressed not only in the park's name, but is also repeated in official documents and reports such as the management plan for this park that was elaborated in 2004 by the Instituto Nacional do Meio Ambiente dos Recursos Naturais Renováveis and the Fundação Pro Natureza. So this management plan, which is really a technical document that talks about the park's uh, history, geophysical qualities, uh, policies, recommended policies for the future, it's really not a literary or um, a more kind of a, a, dissertative piece. It's, it's rather a technical document. Nevertheless, the plan states that uh, the setting of the novel is the north of Minas Gerais 
and more specifically, the Cerrados of the right and left banks of San Francisco River, whose typologies are found nearly completely preserved in the National Park. So we can see how even in the technical document, there is this uh, uh, concern about preserving the reality of the, of the, of the, the novel setting. I'm going to go back to this, this image because it's beautiful and I may enjoy taking a look at it while I talk about the park. So in the case of the Grande Sertão Veredas, uh, but, uh, and this is the, the, one of the main paradoxes of this park, and that may bring us some insight on the many problems involved in uh, using um, um, novelistic realities as parameters for environmental policies. So in, the, in this case, uh, we have been a progressive expansion of the park. So the park area more than doubled uh, in the early 2000s. But at the same time, we have uh, this uh, progressive removal of local populations. They are the veredeiros. And we also have ongoing construction of infra infrastructure for tourism and scientific research. And most, most notably for the present discussion, uh, an increasing use of Guimarães Rosa's work to mediate the visitor's experience in the area. So we can note, it, for example, when the first park's trail was opened in 2015, so it took a long time before the park's creation and uh, the beginning of like a more specific touristic infrastructure, but in 2015 there was this first trail, and it's lined with signs about the flora and fauna of the region, and it includes passages of the novel, Grande Sertão Veredas, in which those um, uh, birds and plants and animals are mentioned. So here we have a case in which the textual environment is literally inscribed in onto the real one, as if to affirm this reversed form of mimesis in which the actual Sertão tries to represent the fictional one. As such, uh, the, 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 this park aims at recreating an original landscape but it invokes two contrasting origins. So first we have a time before the area was shaped by human activity, which is at the very conception, or sorry, is at the heart of the of national parks as a conceptual tool uh, to understand um, conservation, conservationist policies. So the national park is in general an area that is devoid of humans and that tries to recreate this impression of a raw nature. Uh, but on the other hand, we have uh, the other origin for the park, which is uh, the setting of the novel, of Guimarães Rosa's novel, right? Where, and the novel takes place in the first half of the 20th, in the early 20th century. Uh, and it is a, an area shaped by human activity. It is an area where you can find uh, veredeiros, local inhabitants, you know, Basically, not, not everywhere, there are some areas in the novel that are pretty uh, empty, but uh, it is uh, very far from being a novel that uh, like brings these notions of a raw, pristine nature on which the idea of national parks relies. Uh, so caught in between these two ideals, uh, the national park as raw nature and the, the, the history of human and nature entanglements that is present in the novel, uh, the veredeiros and the relocation demonstrate how problematic it is to imitate a fictional landscape marked by human presence with the conceptual tool of a national park. It is not by chance that the management plan that I talked about earlier devotes a significant attention to local cultures to describing like a you know, local traditions and all that, while it narrates the very process of removing them from the parks area. The novel, on the one hand, provides a legitimized model of landscape that the parks managers are to follow. And on the other, it undermines the very premise of this empty, untouched space on which the very idea of national park depends. Now I'm going to turn to uh, Alejo Carpentier, in order to understand the Cuban author's writings on the Gran Sabana, this area in the southwest of Venezuela, uh, and, and how uh, his writings shed new lights onto this relationship between fiction and conservation. So uh, located in the Venezuelan Guiana, the Gran Sabana or Great Savannah is an area primarily protected by the Canaima National Park, 
which was created in 1962 and expanded in 1975, becoming a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1994. And it is home to the world's highest waterfall, Angel Falls, which you can see here, uh, and the large remarkable table rocks known as Tepuyes. This is a, this is a Tepuy. Uh, and the region has been inspiring for many decades a relatively large number of cultural products, including novels, travel accounts, films, TV programs, and publicity pieces. It is also the main site for Carpentier's uh, 1953 novel, Los Pasos Perdidos, The Lost Steps, which was published in English in 1956, the same year in which Grand Sertão Veredas came out. So Carpentier moved to Caracas in 1945 and took his first trip to the Venezuelan Amazon two years later in July of 1947. Fascinated, he re returned in 1948. He wrote about his travels in the series of newspaper articles, Vision de America, and in many other essays, talks, and journalistic contributions. Many of these pieces, and especially Los Pasos Perdidos, whose co which cover you can see here, present the Venezuelan Guiana as an enclosed and self-sufficient uh, uh, space with a sharp alterity operating in opposition to an oil-fueled modernity on which Venezuela's economy was already uh, fully dependent at the time. Well, Carpentier's, uh, Carpentier famously called the Orinoco, the uh, river, una materialización del tiempo, a materialization of time, in a lecture in Caracas in 1975, the novel's compartmentalization of historical periods in spaces of the jungle also dovetails with a certain environmental stasis. So uh, the jungle in the novel encompasses different times uh, from romanticism to a neolithic, uh, and is a jungle relatively invulnerable to change from the outside. And this periodization is uh, like uh, completely based on a Western history. Uh, so each part of the novel and as uh, the protagonist and his uh, fellow travelers, um, like a travel deeper in the jungle, uh, he narrates them as like each step goes a bit further in time understood from a perspective, uh, from a European perspective. So despite the vast area of the jungle, he explained, uh, oh, sorry, and now I'm going to quote. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I don't have this, uh, this passage here. Well, anyways, despite the vast area of the jungle, he explained to me, embracing mountains, abysses, treasures, nomad peoples, the remains of lost civilizations, it was nevertheless a world compact, complete, which fed its own fauna and its men, shaped its own clouds, assembled its meteors, brought it on its rains, a hidden nation, a map in code, a vast vegetable kingdom with few entrances, end of quote. So this is one of the ways in which uh, the protagonist of the novel describes this feeling of the jungle, right? This vegetable kingdom with few entrances. So the environmental changes wrought by extractivist activity and technology in the Orinoco River Basin, as Charlotte Rogers discusses in detail, alarmed Carpentier and are visible in the novel through, for example, the presence of an airplane, as well as mentions of mining and oil drilling. There's so that we have this contrast between these elements and the novel representation of the jungle as a, an immutable reality akin to that of the genesis, una materialización del tiempo, no? that dramatizes the multifaceted, uh, at times ambiguous set of assumptions and desires upon which Carpentier's Gran Sabana is built. After all, Carpentier's years in Venezuela and his writings on the Amazon also coincide with the country's early steps towards conservationist initiatives, initially led by the Swiss naturalist uh, Henri Pitié, and culminating in the creation of its first national park. On the other hand, there is no indication that Carpentier had any uh, direct involvement in such initiatives or in other conservationist movements. In a global context of deep uncertainty regarding the nuclear threat after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Carpentier's environmental concerns co uh, instead belong to a planetary scale. He fully shared the nuclear anxieties of, the, of his time in his articles published in Letra Solfa in the newspaper El Nacional 
in which he also manifests curiosity about flying saucers as, uh, and the possibility of communication with alien forms of life. So to a certain extent, we could suppose that this interplanetary reality is uh, to be as marvelous as the American one, uh, in, as explained in his theory of the real maravilloso, the marvelous real, with the nuclear counterpart as a dystopian facet. So taking all these vectors into consideration, I investigate how Carpentier's writings in his Venezuelan years, especially Los Pasos Perdidos, helped shape and were shaped by this environmental imaginary of the Gran Sabana. More specifically, I propose a parallel between the history of environmental conservation in the Venezuelan Amazon and the way Los Pasos Perdidos conserves that forested area, both through its representation in the forest as a static autonomous realm and through its contact points with conservationist initiatives. In the Gran Sabana's transformation into a national park and later into a UNESCO World Heritage Site is also the result of its cultural, its recognizable cultural status as a precious lost world, I propose that fiction plays a role in portraying certain areas as recognizable sites of memory, which is exactly what Carpentier does with the Gran Sabana, uh, and that these sites of memory must be conserved in real life through the creation of national parks and other conservation units. So this is, of course, a much more indirect process uh, than uh, the one via which Guimarães Rosa's work informs the Gran Sertão Veredas National Park. Uh, what is at stake here in the Venezuelan case is rather a large circuit of many actors, of which Carpentier is but one, although, as I try to show in my chapter, not a negligible one. Yet there are certain, uh, we could say that there is a certain structure of feeling, going back to Raymond Williams' terminology, underlying these forms of engagement with these areas through cultural products. Moreover, the very way these areas are managed may be, I argue, conditioned by certain fictionalizing operations implied in the concept of conserved areas itself, uh, which these novels both support and, and critique. So with this in mind, I'm going to move to the final section of this uh, presentation. You can see here the Pixar, a scene from the Pixar film Up, uh, which was inspired by the Gran Sabana and this waterfall is like, a, you know, a fictional representation of Angel Falls. So uh, let's put here together these two works in order to bring some thesis on the relationship between fiction writing and conservation in Latin America. National parks, as we know, try to recreate these environments as they would have looked like before human presence and before deforestation. This is the case even in parks as Canaima, in which Pemon villages uh, still live inside the park's areas, allowing, according to a 2000 estimate, uh, the approximate presence of 95 indigenous communities and possibly more than 8,000 inhabitants inside the park's area. At the, same part, at the same time, most parks also allow non-Indigenous peoples to enter for scientific research and tourism. Therefore, national parks aim to recreate this uh, appearance of an untouched nature and in doing so to recover an environmental memory of a certain area before the arrival of uh, non-Indigenous humans. Even when there are Indigenous groups in the area, they are often seen through an idealized gaze uh, that, as Luis Angosto Fernandez shows, insists on ignoring their gradual inclusion in capitalist economies and instead relegates them to an ancient temporality in what Johannes Fabian has called the denial of coevalness. So what I argue is that uh, this maintenance of the aspect of an untransformed uh, nature entails a fictionalization of the protected area through which a certain environmental imaginary is applied to it and becomes its aim. Uh, we can think, for example, of uh, the work Fictional Worlds by Thomas Pavel uh, that proposes an understanding of fictions as secondary universes that integrate a dual structure whose base or primary universe is the real world. The secondary universes are understood as possible worlds in terms of modal logic uh, that is, as an alternative states of affairs 
that maintain a certain relation with the possible with the with other possible worlds including the real one or the base uh, we can think of religion that's one example that pavel brings as a good example of this dual structure that shows that such possible worlds are not necessarily understood as fictions. Fictional texts also work, uh, although differently, as salient worlds that may include components that do not exist in the real world or that shed light on some aspect of it that is not unusually, uh, that is not usually perceived. So to question, the question to ask in the case of a national park in an area uh, that is usually seen as remote as Kanaima, and it was even more inaccessible when the park was created. Uh, so the question is the degree to which the secondary, this fictional universe, might shape the very notion of the primary universe. In other words, to what extent is the area upon which the imaginary boundaries of the park are to be set, uh, are to be seen as raw nature? precisely because of this continuous portrayal of this area uh, in cultural products as raw nature or almost raw nature. In the absence of access to a primary existent world, the secondary fictional world takes precedence in determining how the primary universe looks like and should continue to look like. The idea of establishing a protected area already implies a certain view of nature to which a referential uh, to which the reality must conform. And this process becomes even more dependent on external perspectives in the case of an area both hard to access by those creating the park and frequently portrayed in cultural objects like the Gran Sabana and the Rosa and Sertão. So on the one hand, they are very present in novels and TV shows and all that. But on the other hand, uh, they are not uh, physically present very in the in the minds of the of the of a, a good portion of the audience to which these cultural products are directed. Um, so, therefore, this antithetical combination um, of cultural attention and difficulty of access put the salient fictional world of Grande Sertão Veredas and Los Passos Perdidos in a privileged position to intervene in the expected state of affairs in the real world. Um, the specific impact of a single work on consequent policies may vary significantly. Of course, when we talk about the Grand Sertão Veredas National Park, uh, we have uh, this an, an imaginary that is problematically built on its uh, namesake novel, at the same time as an ideal of untouched nature. Unlike Grand Sertão Veredas and its park, Los Passos Perdidos did not directly inspire the creation of the Canaima National Park. Uh, the name is, also, is rather attached to Romulo Gallegos' 1935 Amorimus novel. Um, official documents about the park do not mention the novel, and its reference uh, no, do not mention Los Passos Perdidos, and its influence may be perceived only indirectly especially in areas with notable landmarks not mentioned in the book, such as Angel Falls and Mount Roraima. Yet the numerous descriptions analyzed above of the forest, either within or outside the Gran Sabana area as marvelous and uncanny, may well work as carriers of a specific view of the region that the novel uh, both participates in and propagates and questions. Uh, so, even though Los Passos Perdidos uh, clearly places the forest in a se separate realm, uh, where self-sufficient is coupled with an apparent stasis that only... Oh, sorry, there is a... Okay, my apologies. So I'm going to go back to the beginning of the sentence. So uh, Los Passos Perdidos places the forest in a separate realm uh, where self-sufficiency is coupled with an apparent stasis that only obscures a series of cycles and transformations hardly perceptible to outsiders. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the appearance of stillness does not actually mean a pause. Carpentier's jungle actually finds itself in perpetual motion, which often reveals the long history of exchanges and mutual interactions among human and non-human actors. So these changes include the destruction as well as the creation of cities, 
in a deviation from the common understanding of deforestation and urbanization as a uni unilinear phenomenon. Moreover, they are manifest to randomness and relative indifference to the purposes of outsiders becomes evident when the narrator, after having gone back to a big city in the Northern hemisphere that we may assume to be New York, is prevented from returning to the forest by a flood that has covered the marks in a tree trunk, signaling the entrance of Santa Monica de los Venados, that's the little town where he wanted to live. This analysis of the two novels and two national parks thus show how narrative conservation and conservationist narratives complement each other. Narrative conservation encompasses the representation of environments in fictional worlds, basically in novels. Narratives such as Los Passos Perdidos and Grande Sertão Veredas becomes carriers of environmental memories that remain active through generations and may reverberate in other cultural objects and projects. All the cultural objects about a certain environment compose the set of lived experiences of structures of feeling that advocates for keeping it as it was or recreate, keeping it as it is or recreating it as it once was. In their turn, conservationist narratives are the fictionalizing operations by which parks become, come to be seen as raw, untransformed nature even when this pristine state is only achieved through comprehensive interference in the area, whether through the removal of local populations and destruction of settlements, uh, fire management, animal and plant control, or trail and road construction. These two modalities uh, of interpenetration between conservation and fictionality uh, mutually enhance each other. Fictional narratives may raise environmental awareness and promote conservationist initiatives, while national parks and other conservation units fuel the environmental imaginaries of these areas that may lead to some interest in the novels themselves. At the same time, Los Pasas Perdidos and other novels may introduce critical parameters that allow, allow readers to perceive, for example, a longer history of human and non-human interaction, rather than assuming that these environments are simply untouched. Uh, so Los Pasos Perdidos and Grande Sertão Veredas at the same time as they uh, benefit the creation of these areas, they uh, often challenge or offer a critical perspective on the assumptions uh, implied in the creation of those areas, of those conservation areas. So by making this argument about the relationship between national parks and fictions, I surely do not mean to imply that national parks are fictions or that they have any undesirable artificiality that should be rejected or they lack legitimacy. To be sure, cultural projects do not have the same kinds of effects as does the actual maintenance of the parks, which is a fundamental form of uh, 20th and 21st century environmental policy. Fictional works do not have the power uh, to establish and alter policies and management practices, of course, nor do they intervene directly on the referential reality of the park. Yet, and now arriving at the conclusion, uh, fictional works may help in developing a set of fictionalizing operations that justify the objectives of the parks, legitimize their experience, their existence, uh, and make them more visible. This is especially true in a park of literary inspiration as Grande Sertão Veredas, but a similar conservationist mentality, not seldom based on fictionalizing, fictionalized images of pristine environments, is at work in virtually any park. In fact, even parks that do not have cultural objects specifically attached to them that are not portrayed in books, films, or TV series, and that may be even uh, known only to a small portion of local populations, also benefit from this uh, broader environmental imaginary that fuels this longing for an untouched nature to exist. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Victoria, for this very interesting and inspiring uh, presentation about your research that has to do a lot with literary reception, I think, and this uh, um, uh, relationship that you make between uh, fiction and conservation. I think it's fascinating. And I have a, a lot of comments and questions, but I've, there's already questions here, so I really want to give a place to the participants. And then uh, if there is time, I'm going to make you... Uh, my question. So there's a question from um, 
Kenneth uh, Nsa that says, um, well, so that uh, is a wonderful presentation. And he asks if are all these parks that you're mentioning, uh, all these parks you mentioned, are the local and indigenous people allowed to live in them or are, are they expelled from them? Thank you very much, Kenneth, for your comment and your question. Um, well, I would argue that the presence of indigenous populations is usually uh, the most contentious issue and the one uh, through which we can most clearly see how uh, the novels can offer a critical view on the sparks. Um, it's, it really depends. So in the case of Kanaima, yes, uh, there are many indigenous villages uh, in the area of the park and that have remained there. Uh, Amanda Smith just published a book in which she discusses a bit uh, the reality of the Kanaima National Park. Uh, so I recommend this reading. Um, and um, uh, in the case of Grande Sertão Veredas, uh, so it's not specifically an indigenous population. Uh, the Veredeiros, uh, they have like, a, it's a, a, a big racial diversity. You know, you have like a, some uh, indigenous component, but also um, uh, Afro-Brazilian component, but also European. Uh, so we're really talking about a population that has been um, like a, having like a long history of migration and, and all that. Uh, and also some uh, immigrants that came from the South uh, later in the 1960s from the South of Brazil. Uh, so we are talking about a racially diverse population in the case of Grandes Sertão Veredas, uh, but that, of course, still has some indigenous uh, uh, component in the legacy. And the, the, the thing with Grandes Sertão Veredas National Park is that for a good, uh, uh, for many years, uh, right after the creation of the park, uh, they should have been removed, but they were not just because, you know, the park was created in the paper but uh, it was not transformed into an, a national park uh, in concrete terms until the early 2000s. Uh, so they remained there, but mostly in, an, mostly in an irregular fashion. And then in the early 2000s, uh, there was really a push to make the national park be a national park. Uh, and the Veredeiros were little by little removed. Um, and of course, this is never a good deal for them, right? So they were offered the option of having a financial indemnification or receiving a, a piece of land in another area uh, close to uh, Formoso, which is an area that is not as interesting for them because the water supply is much lower than in the area of the park. Uh, so of course it was a loss for them, uh, but they, well, they did not really have the option. Uh, talking to um, uh, local people in the closest uh, city, the Chapada Gaúcha, uh, they say that there was a larger form, farm inside the area that uh, was also deactivated, but the farmer uh, received a much better financial indemnification for giving the farm to, to, to the building of the national park. So we can see how all these inequalities uh, play out in a very localized level. And you know, national parks throughout Latin America, they have a very heterogeneous region, uh, history of either allowing indigenous and local populations to remain in the parks area, not allowing them, but not enforcing their removal uh, or, you know, simply removing them. And, and we need to see it on a case by case basis. But in any situation that is almost always uh, um, this problem of what to do with the local populations that should not be a problem, but becomes a problem from the point of view of uh, conservationist and environmental management. And, uh, and I think the novels provide a good uh, window through which we can understand and approach these problems. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. We have another comment or question from Roberto Favalinho. Um, he thanks you for a very interesting talk. Um, he um, says, if possible, I would like to hear more about your concept of reversal mimesis, especially regarding the Grand Grand Salto, in the sense that to me, uh, uh, Riobaldo uh, 
the information, the informant to the narrator is always fighting the possibility of representing the Sartau. He's always saying that the Sartau doesn't fit in the pages uh, of the narrator. So could you talk more about this transformation from a certain anti my Mises from uh, Riovaldo to the reverse my Mises from the natural parts? Thank you very much, Roberto. That's a very, very good point. Uh, so yeah, here about him, he talks about the impossibility of representing the Sertão, but he's all the time defining the Sertão, right? Uh, o Sertão está em toda parte, o Sertão é do tamanho do mundo, o Sertão é sem lugares, né? Uh, so he, he really, there is this action of defining the Sertão. And one of the things that uh, Grande Sertão Veredas bring also to our... Um, uh, to the very history of literary representations of the Sertão is uh, a certain uh, geographical uh, kind of messiness, you know, because uh, Sertão is itself a colonial term, is a term that has been used by the Portuguese since the 15th century. In fact, even outside of Brazil has been used in the coast of Africa, in Asia, uh, to define the areas that are beyond the colonial frontier. Uh, so it is a highly relational term that has primarily a colonial connotation and it has been like that uh, for, you know, all the colonial history uh, of Portugal in Brazil and elsewhere. Uh, and after Brazil's independence, it started being used, uh, it kept this relational quality as being this area that is kind of out there, that is beyond the urban perimeters, that is beyond uh, the areas, the agricultural frontier, right? It's like this is spaces that are unoccupied, and this is the way Sertão kept being used until at the turn of the century, a lot uh, due to the work of Euclides da Cunha uh, and then the novella, the Romances da Cerca, right? Uh, the Sertão was uh, progressively, progressively more attached to this geographical area of the Northeast of Brazil, right? The uh, Caatinga. Uh, but what Guimarães Rosa does, and I do, and I, and I, I talk more about that in my book, and I'm also writing about that in other places, is to recover this uh, relationality of the term Sertão that is implied in the colonial usage of the term, but in order to attach to it a certain existential or almost mystical connotation. So the Sertão is everywhere, uh, can mean both that, you know, the Sertão is uh, like, a, in the Sertão we can find the depths of our soul that is everywhere, but at the same time, the Sertão is everywhere, uh, like uh, brings this colonial resonances as the Sertão, as a space that is beyond the colonial frontier, right? So I would say that Giobaldo, at the same time as he brings our attention to this unrepresentability, he does represent the Sertão, and he represents the Sertão by recovering uh, this, uh, this uh, longer history, this multifaceted meaning, uh, history of the, of the term Sertão. So uh, in this sense, uh, this reversed mimesis. Well, this is something that uh, could in theory happen with many other works, but I have not found many, many uh, cases in which you have like a, such a clear case of conservation units such as the Grande Sertão Veredas National Park that tries to recreate uh, the, the novels the setting in referential reality. So in the first moment, I would say that the reverse mimesis is not dependent on uh, like uh, the, the, the possibility of representing the Sertão uh, or impossibility that, that Hiobaldo brings. Uh, but I would argue that this whole sense of like a, uh, both the sense of mystery and of perception of the Sertão as a precious, as a, as a special space that is created by Hiobaldo, uh, that it participates in this uh, understanding that this area should somehow be con conserved. Um, and that's how I want to understand how the critical reception of the work may also have had uh, some impact on its ability to become an environmental agent in the Northwest of Minas Gerais. Thank you. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, thank you. Then uh, maybe you can write something in the chat because <laughs> we don't have the possibility to make <laughs> discussion. But um, I'm going to read uh, Stefania's uh, question and then I'm going to go to the Q&A because there are some questions there too. Um, but she thanks so much for the uh, 
interesting cases that you're presenting. And she says, I'd like to know if you think the relation between conservationists and fictions and policies has grown closer with the rise of tourism, the tourism industry and the transformation of landscape as a commodity. And if so, since when do you think this right inverse my missus is operating in the creation of protected areas? Thank you very much, Stefania. Yeah, completely. I, I very much agree that the rise of tourism is, uh, is uh, extremely important for these connections, right? And also, we are talking about uh, here uh, initiatives, uh, like in the chapter analyze the Guimarães Rosa touristic circuit, for example, that is not a conservation area per se, is rather like a, a circuit that provides map information, you know, uh, some resources for the tourist who wants to travel in the in the areas where Guimarães Rosa's works were set and like have this constant operation of um, deviating their gaze from the signs of like uh, from soy plantations, from eucalyptus plantation, you know, and all that in order to see the Rosian landscape in it. And if you think of many of those initiatives, uh, there is a very, um, there is a, a, a kind of a distorted engagement with the novels themselves, right? So they're not really trying to bring the novel in a faithful way, but rather like uh, evoke this uh, uh, many times idealized gaze that many times may be, um, may be inaccurate in relation to what the novels actually say or bring to us. Uh, but that uh, implies a certain, yeah, um, um, a certain commodification, both of landscape and of the and of the realities, the fictional realities of the novels themselves. Yeah, so tourism is a big drive. In fact, the Grande Sertão Veredas National Park uh, started to be much more like uh, controlled, much more managed, so to speak, in order to bring in some touristic infrastructure. And but, you know, when we think about tourism, you also have to think about and going back to uh, Kenneth's question about indigenous and local populations, that while they are often removed from the parks areas, uh, they also can benefit from tourist initiatives, right? Tourism is not necessarily uh, just operated by like uh, large corporations and all that. If you go to these areas, you have many local populations who do benefit from a tourist infrastructure and who do support these initiatives. So uh, when you talk about tourism, it's a much more like a, a porous uh, and heterogeneous set of initiatives. Some of them local, some of them not, uh, that both uh, benefit and uh, harm local populations. Um, so yeah. Yeah, but I agree with you, and we can see this, you know, in all sorts of modalities of literary tourism. If you think, for example, I don't know of uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, and then there is the Bloomsday, right? That is around the corner, in June 16, I think, in which in Dublin, you know, there are tours and people go to the places where the novel took place, you know, and the many uh, like uh, Casa Museos, right? Uh, These houses where certain novels could have taken place and and you know this this is really this is really present in the way in which uh, you can find that this interface between um uh literary works especially very canonical ones as the ones i have been dealing with in my in my book and and these touristic initiatives thank you so much um now uh joseph uh wagner uh, wager, I'm sorry. Um, he says, thank you for this excellent discussion of literature and conservation. Um, the question is, in what ways could literary works offer ways to think of relationships to the environment outside the national frame? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, thank you very much. Uh, relationship outside. Yeah, so the idea of national parks, of course, is very tied to, to the nation, right, and to preserving the, 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 the beautiful spaces of the nation. And many times when you think about conservation, you think about some kind of, uh, you know, uh, legislation around it and also uh, public funds 
Um, so when you think about uh, conservation, at least using the framework of conservation units, units there is um, an is it almost necessary institutional framework uh, that uh, brings kind of this, um, uh, like this considerations on the nation as uh, a background uh, that justifies and that manages the creation of these initiatives. So you could also say that this is another case in which uh, the reading of novels may be to a certain extent misplaced in order to uh, address uh, this institutional framework. Uh, now, you could think of, uh, I think all this like a localized initiatives, even the, the Guimarães Rosa Touristic Circuit, the Projeto Manuelzão, uh, and other conservation initiatives that do not operate within the institutional uh, infrastructure, you know, of the government, uh, they could be, they many times do not bring the national frame uh, to them. They work much more in a localized, uh, in a localized um, uh, realm uh, that can have a more kind of independent way of thinking. Yeah, I have to think more about that because also, you know, the two processes that work together, as I try to show in my book, is the fact that because these novels are so canonic, um, there is kind of a, a correlation, you know, between the canonicity and the perception that they are important and they should be read in their presence, even perhaps like not through their own text, for example, through filmic adaptations and all that, and to their larger presence in cultural imaginaries. So there is a correlation between that and uh, the and the, 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 the act of going back to the areas where they are set and trying to create some kind of amalgamation of both. Um, so in this sense, when you think of canon, you usually also work in a national framework, right? So uh, not necessarily, uh, but we are talking about here processes that tend to, to have a confluence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just to keep with the time, we're going to take the, the, the last question. Uh, this is by Gisela Jefes, and she says the wonderful talk, uh, the Victoria. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on the idea of fiction playing a role in the construction of spaces as sites of memory and on the need for its conservation? Thank you, Gisela. Yeah, I had a, a little... Um... A passage that I ended up by cutting from this uh, from this um, uh, from this presentation, that is by uh, Pierre Nora, uh, this uh, critic who has theorized the whole lieu de mémoire, right, the sites of memory, uh, which many times also work within an institutional framework like the UNESCO World Heritage Sites and all that. Uh, so um, this works. They are sites of memory, but I would say that they also create memory, right? They create a cultural memory that may not depend on the personal memory uh, of those who go to these areas or those who, uh, whose parents have gone to these areas. So in my chapter, I also talk about um, like uh, this uh, idea of environmental memory through the works of Lawrence Buell. Uh, in which he talks about, yeah, like the, 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 the environmental memory of a certain area very attached to personal experience, you know, people who saw the place where they grew up, for example, change, or the place where their parents lived, uh, go through changes that they have not seen, but there's this generational uh, memory, or they, on the contrary, may forget, there's the generational amnesia, right? So uh, memory is many times uh, theorized uh, in relation to the environment as being a space uh, that concerns like uh, the personal experience, right? The local experience, the sense of place, right? And what I tried to do in my book is to introduce more uh, or to think more about something that is uh, present across environmental studies. Um, uh, that is the role of mediation, the mediation of novels in the case of my book, but we could say of other cultural projects that do create sites of memories uh, that do not depend so much on a, the personal experience of a, like a personal sense of, of place, you know. Uh, so that's a, that's a bit 
the way, the direction I take. And going back to Pierre Nora, I say that national parks try to create uh, not lieu de mémoire, mais lieu avant la mémoire, places before, sites before memory, right? So sites before uh, the, the, the impact of human action, which is, of course, um, a very problematic uh, assumption, as I hope to have showed to you all in this presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Victoria, for this uh, for your presentation, for it, for sharing your research and uh, and the uh, research you've done in your work in the in it's published in your book, and uh, for the interesting discussion from the from all of you that have participated, and we had some more comments, but we're not going to be able to continue so that we can keep with the times that we have um, decided for the for a workshop so thank you so much for uh, your participation and uh, we hope to see you in the in the panels in the parallel sessions that, that follow and, and to discuss maybe more with uh, what you have presented and, the, and what Gisela has presented in the first days to integrate them in the discussion thank you. panels Thank you so much, Asisana. It was a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for being here for, and for the great questions. And yeah, and I look forward to seeing, well, some of you in the next parallel sessions. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll see you at uh, 1430 for, in Stockholm, at least. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.